All right. Uh, welcome to the first of a number of uh, stand-up problem discussion videos. We're not going to be solving problems right away, but we're going to be talking about some of the information you should have gleaned out of Chapter 3 in the Introduction to Hydraulics and Hydrology, the Stormwater book by Gribbon. First off, remember that I told you for the most part to not read too deeply there because the way that uh, Mr. Gribben is presenting this is making it in some ways harder than what you should know and a little bit less transferable. We want to remember that when we are dealing with hydrostatic pressure, we are looking at a whole bunch of little forces over little areas which add up to a whole force over a whole area. And so what we do is we come upon a, uh, a concept called <coughs> Uh, result and the resultants are going to be great and many in number as you talk about vectors. So let's start with the fact that force is a vector. And so we'll write the force here, right, with that format there. And we'll see how that picks up on the camera, right? Force is a vector. Now, uh, other things that are a vector, right? Distance or the radial vector is a vector. Displacement is a vector. Uh, velocity which you know is dr dt or r dot or acceleration is a vector and if you remember in the end what force being was equal to back from physics force equals mass times acceleration which is a vector a vector times a scalar equals a vector so We'll be talking a lot over the next two semesters, and we should have been talking a little bit earlier about the different types of forces and how they actually manifest themselves. You have, and essentially you'll be looking at point loads and distributed loads. Weight, when you drew a free body diagram, you showed it as originally as a point load, but you know that weight is not a point load, weight is distributed. So in the past, if you were doing a free body diagram, for instance, of a free falling body, you might have shown it like this, with only one force on it being weight. Right? And in this case, of course, you don't have to mark the vector. Weight is always a vector. Sometimes if we forget, uh, weight is a force, force is always a vector. But if you show it here, in reality, the way we want to show weight because it is not the weight on one particular spot, it is the weight or the resultant over everything. We're going to show it with a single or a double hatch. That's going to let us know that the weight is not the weight at one point, the weight is distributed over the entire uh, object. Let me erase that out and then we'll come to some summary. Let's now look at this ball sitting on the table and I'll show that here. If that ball is sitting on a table, and I ask you or one is thought, uh, is asked to draw a free body diagram, what were the steps that you were to go through? The first step, what is the free body? You have to decide that, and that's going to be an important aspect of much problem solving. We won't be draw drawing one free body, we'll be drawing many free bodies. But in this case, the free body, let's say, is the ball. What is, quote unquote, touching the ball? What is, quote unquote, touching the ball? And when we say the quote unquote, we have then the force due to gravity, which we call weight, having units of newtons or pounds or tons. Now, it's a free body diagram. We isolate the body and we continue our question of what is touching but no longer in the quotes. Other things that it would have been in the quotes for touching would have been things like an electromagnetic force or a magnetic force. So in this case, uh, gravity is acting down and acting up is again the normal force which we're going to see depending on how round that ball is is either a distributed reactive force or just a reactive force which we show with one hatch. If in fact that ball is flattened, 
due to deformity, if it's flattened due to deformity, we're going to show three hatches because it is a reactive distributed force. These are standard in that a resultant is shown with two hatches typically and a, I'm sorry, a resultant is shown with two hatches and a reactive force is shown with one hatch. Going to three hatches is going to help us as we start thinking at, about uh, distributed reactive forces. For instance, foundation stresses and pressures, which we've talked about a little bit, but we've never actually gone into the delving of it, and delving deep into it. So, in summary, what we're going to do with our free bodies is we will use a single hat, a double hatch for our resultant. And usually that resultant is not going to be the sum of two vectors. It's going to be the resultant of a pressure distribution, which we'll cover in a little bit. We're going to use a single hatch if it's a reactive force. A reactive force, something like the normal force. You push against the wall, the wall push against you, one of Newton's laws. And we're going to use essentially a triple hatch if it's a reactive resultant. A reactive resultant. And this one is the one that's a little less standard. All right. Double hatch resultant, single hatch reactive force, and double, triple hatch a reactive resultant. All right, I'm going to cut this video, see how it works, post it out, and continue on, which will probably be 30 to 40 minutes of discussion, discussing free bodies and resultants. We can't talk about one without talking about the other. We've had them in physics, we've talked about them before, and this is when you're going to start to see we're not just going to be talking about forces, we're going to be talking about moments.